Let's just close our eyes and bow down our heads and let's offer a word of prayer for our fathers. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you again that you are the perfect father. And we praise you. We praise you, O oh Father, because you have fearfully and wonderfully made each and every one of us. You have uh, shepherded and nurtured each one of us. You have disciplined and you are, Lord, doing that too. You've disciplined and challenged us so that we can, Lord, we can grow and we can flourish in your purpose and your plans for us. Father God, we want to thank you this, this morning, Lord, again, for your perfect example. And we praise you that as we celebrate Father's Day, that it is you who shows us through your example how we as fathers need to love, need to shepherd, need to nurture and discipline and challenge so that our sons and daughters can also grow and flourish in this world as you have planned. So Heavenly Father, as we, as we look up to you this morning, we pray that you'd bless, you'd bless all fathers today with wisdom, with patience, with courage, and above all, O oh Lord, with your love for their children. And Father God, we pray that you'd bless all the children today with the Lord, with, with an openness to correction, with an eagerness to learn, and above all, O oh Lord, a love for their fathers too. Father God, we pray that you'd bless those who are fatherless today. We pray that you'd surround them with godly men to teach and affirm and guide. And Lord, above all, to to help them to love with the love of a father in your strength. So Lord, we pray and commit all the fathers who are in your hands. Bless them and make them a blessing in their homes, in their families, in their neighborhoods, in their societies, in the city, in this nation. May we continue to live for you and for your glory. Thank you again, O oh Lord, for listening. In Jesus' most precious name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Let's, let's go to our memory verse for the month, which also talks about a father, incidentally. Let's all try to remember this, this verse. Let's all say together, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 14, 21. Yes. We, we all know that Jesus left the glories of heaven, and he came down into this world in obedience to his Father's will. We all know that. Uh, Jesus came down to give his life away because he loved his father and his father's will. He loved you. He loved me. Now let me just flip that over and ask you. So Jesus left heaven and he came down into this world, right? Because he loves you, he loves me. Let me flip that now. Why do you want to go to heaven? Why do you want to go to heaven? To see your loved ones who've gone before you? Sure, I know, I know that, you know, all of us miss our loved ones who've gone before us. But for a Christian, for a true Christian who loves Jesus first, the only reason to want to go to heaven is to see Jesus, is to be with Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. So, don't get me wrong when I say this. So, you know, when our parents die, 
and people say oh now they are together in heaven united you know together in heaven when when our brothers and sisters die and we say oh now our family is together in heaven those are those are comforting words for our grief over here yes but if our loved one who passed away truly loved jesus then jesus comes first they are in heaven with jesus first and everything else everyone else is secondary and i and, and it really should be the same over here in this world also for every christian listen to what jesus says in luke 14:26 listen to this very very carefully because i think you know our a longing for heaven and to be with jesus because of our love for him it needs to begin over here and listen to what jesus says if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters yes even his own life he cannot be my disciple did you hear that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters yes even his own life he cannot be my disciples now jesus is not saying that we should hate anyone jesus is not saying that we should hate our own family members our father and mother our brothers and sisters our wife our children no jesus is not telling us to hate but our love for jesus should be first our love for jesus should be so so much more that in comparison our love for our father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters should seem like hatred did you get that our love for jesus should be first and should be so much that in comparison to that love for our love for jesus our love for our own family even our own life should should be like hatred it should appear like hatred because of our love for jesus i hope i hope you all understand this and don't just love jesus with words don't just love jesus with words again let's let's remember our memory verse again let's say it again whoever has my commandments and keeps them he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and i will love him and manifest myself to him john 14:21 um jesus first always Jesus first always now which tribe of israel did jesus come from does anyone remember that judah. which tribe of israel did jesus come from judah judah right judah and as we continue in our sermon series on the book of joshua does anyone remember which tribe received their inheritance first in the promised land in joshua 14 anyone remember which tribe received their inheritance first in the promised land you remember we looked at caleb last sunday and god had chosen caleb to be the representative of the tribe of judah okay judah first and remember again jesus comes from the tribe of judah but why judah first why judah first well that's because of judah's father jacob you know before jacob died when he was old and he was blind you know jacob blessed all his sons he blessed all his sons in genesis uh, 49:8 onwards we we read of his blessing specifically to judah genesis 49 verses 8 onwards 
uh, you know, Jacob, this is what he blesses Judah with. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. That's a prophecy. Years and years, centuries back, right? That Judah would dominate over his enemies, over all his brothers. He would have prominence. And now, if you realize in, in, in Joshua that, that comes true, Judah is the one who gets his inheritance first. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's cub from the prey. My son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? Anyone remember the song that we sing? The Lion of Judah? Remember that? Well, that's, that's Revelation 5.5. Okay? And that's talking about Jesus. The Lion of Judah. But it's prophesied over here by Jacob centuries ago. And then verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Again, this is a prophecy of the one who would come from the tribe of Judah. The scepter, the ruler's staff. It's talking about a king. It's talking about a messiah. It's talking about Jesus. Again, a prophecy about King Jesus, the Messiah. And verses 11 and 12, you know, it talks a lot about, about wine. Um, you know, and uh, this is a prophecy that Judah's territory, you know, will, will have a lot of vineyards. Now, if you remember the 12 spies who went into the promised land, you remember that they brought back a huge cluster of grapes. You know, two people were carrying it between them. In Numbers chapter 13, verses 23 and 24, you read about that. It was from the valley of Eshkol, which is in Judea, from the land that was given to this tribe of Judah. Again, a prophecy that is fulfilled in the book of Joshua. And here is how that promised land was distributed among the, 12, among the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the fulfillment of a father's blessing to his sons. Also, Jacob blessing his children. Now, I'm sure, you know, as fathers and mothers, we pray for our children. If you don't, you know, start doing that, uh, pray. Pray always for your children. But as you pray for your children, bless them. Bless them as parents. Bless them. You know, that's what we see in, in God's word. Parents blessing their children. Bless them. And as you share and live out your faith in God before your children, trust that the God of promises will fulfill those blessings. In the life of your children. Now, uh, if we go back to Joshua chapter 15, that's where we left off last Sunday. Um, in Joshua chapter 15, verses uh, 20 to 63, uh, you know, we will find all the towns of Judah that are listed over there according to their locations. Now, uh, I'm not going to read that, but I request you to kindly, when you go back home, you can read it, okay? It's, again, read it as the prophecy or the promises of God being fulfilled for his children. And now, we come to Joshua chapter 16. Joshua chapter 16. Um, and it goes this way. Uh, the allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel, 
Then going from Bethel to Luz, it passes along to Ataroth, the territory of the Archites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Japhelites, as far as the territory of Lower Bethoron, then to Gezer, and it ends at the sea. The people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim received their inheritance. So, again, uh, you know, in, in chapter 15, 14, 15, we, we see about, you know, the territory first to Judah, and then now it's, you know, verse 4, the people of Joseph. Um, now, as you look at this map, as you look at the map, can anyone see uh, where the allotment to the tribe of Joseph is? Where is the allotment to the tribe of Joseph? Can anyone find that? What was that? The whole thing. The, whole thing. the tribe of Joseph? Is there a tribe of Joseph? No. There is no tribe of Joseph, right? But if you remember in Israel, according to the law of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 17, the firstborn son was entitled to receive a double portion of the inheritance. The firstborn son receives a double portion of the inheritance. Now, a um, lot of questions today, right? Um, who was Jacob's firstborn? Anyone? Jacob's firstborn? Reuben, right? Very good. Uh, Reuben was Jacob's firstborn, but Reuben did not receive the double portion. Okay? Reuben did not receive the double portion. And First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 tells us this. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel... For he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's, father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. Though Judah became strong among his brothers, and a chief came from him, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. Reuben, the son, he committed adultery with his father Jacob's concubine. Bila. We read about that in Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. And because, you know, Reuben, you know, that's how he treated his father. He committed adultery with his father's concubine. Because he did that, Reuben, he lost all the privileges that he had as the firstborn. Jacob, the father, uh, he gave the double portion to Joseph. Because that's, right, that's what it says, right? The birthright belonged to Joseph. Because Reuben treated his father that way, the birthright goes to Joseph. And Jacob the father, he elevates Joseph's two sons, the double portion, remember? And so, it doesn't go to Joseph, but the double portion comes to Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, okay, as Jacob takes them to be his own sons. We read about that in Genesis chapter 48, you know, when Joseph brings his two sons to his old, ailing, blind father, Jacob. You know, this is what Jacob says over there in verse 5. To Joseph, he tells him, now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. He, Jacob accepts uh, Ephraim and Manasseh as his own sons. And that's why you have the tribe of Ephraim, you have the tribe of Manasseh. You don't have the tribe of Joseph. A double portion is given to Joseph. But, you know, even though here, God's plans and purposes, which we sometimes cannot understand because they are much, much higher than us, you know, much higher, we, we cannot understand that. Again, we see that they are fulfilled. You see, 
in verse 1 in verse 1 when joseph brings his two sons to his father to see his um, old blind father he takes them he takes his sons in in order of their birth manasseh did you see that verse 1 so he took with him his two sons manasseh and ephraim manasseh was the first born ephraim was the second born but you see what jacob does in verse 5 did you notice that he says your two sons who were born to you in the land of egypt before i came to you in egypt are mine and you see he flips it ephraim and manasseh shall be mine he flips it and here is god's working you know and if you read uh, you know if you go back home and you read this chapter genesis chapter 48 when joseph um, you know brings his sons forward so that his old father would bless them he places manasseh joseph's firstborn he places him near jacob's right hand and he places ephraim near jacob's left hand he wants his father to bless him to bless his children you know and but blind old jacob what he does is he crosses his hands he crosses his hands and uh, he places his right hand on the younger son ephraim and he gives him priority now joseph knows that that is not right and so he tries to help his father um, you know and verse 18 uh, Genesis 48 and Joseph said to his father not this way my father since this one is the firstborn put your right hand on his head but his father refused and said I know my son I know he shall also become a people and he shall also be great nevertheless his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations and so he blessed them that day saying by you Israel will pronounce blessing saying God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh does he put Ephraim before Manasseh so you see what Jacob does centuries before he puts Ephraim the younger son before Manasseh and uh, if you didn't realize this we also see that in the book of Joshua Joshua also puts the allotment of Ephraim before the allotment to Manasseh you know in Joshua chapter 16 verses 5 through 10 we have the allotment to Ephraim the younger son of Joseph and then you know in Joshua chapter 17 we have uh, the allotment to Manasseh the elder son okay even though Manasseh is the firstborn if you read over there then Ma then the allotment was made to the people of Manasseh for he was the firstborn of Joseph do you see that even though he was the firstborn Ephraim came before as was prophesied um, and again it, it is God's ways and his plans and his purposes now till now we've only been hearing about sons you know God's blessings to the sons right but now you know after this there is something that comes up in in Joshua chapter 17 that shows that our God and the Bible has concern also for the rights of women at that time even at that time when women were treated just as mere property there is importance given to them also and so in Joshua chapter 17 verses 3 and 4 this is what is written now Zelophehad uh, the son of Hefer son of Gilead son of Makir son of Manasseh had no sons but only daughters and these are the names of his daughters Mahala Noah Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. They approached Eliezer the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the, and the leaders and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance 
among, along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. Now, uh, the background to all of this comes from Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 to 11. Numbers 27, 1 through 11, and also Numbers chapter 36, verses 1 through 12. Uh, you know, Zelophehad, he was the great, great grandson of Manasseh, uh, the son of Joseph. Now, Zelophehad, he died having no sons. But this father, even though he did not have sons, he raised his five daughters in the faith. He raised his five daughters in the faith. And so when the father died, the five daughters, they boldly came to Moses and they asked Moses to give them as daughters, to give them what would have been their father's land inheritance. They boldly requested that, you know, their father's land inheritance should not be diverted to the nearest male relative, but it should be given to them, to their daughters. Now, that was not the custom. And so Moses took that matter to God. And God decided in the favor of those five daughters. Why? There's something deeper over here. You see, this father, as I told you, had raised his five daughters in the faith. The people, when all this happened, they were very, they were far away from the promised land. They were far away from the promised land. They had not even crossed the Jordan River. They were on the other side of the Jordan River. The enemies in the promised land had not yet been conquered. Yet, even when they are away, these daughters, they come to Moses, trusting in God, and they claim their inheritance. Even though they are far away from the promised land, even though the enemy hasn't been conquered, they claim the possession of the land that should have been given to their father. That's faith. That's faith even from women. And so God transferred the inheritance of their father to the daughters. And see, these daughters, they teach us. They teach us and they teach especially the ladies. They teach mothers. They teach young girls to not be shy and bashful about, you know, laying hold of God's promised provisions. For you and for your family. God has promised you. Don't be shy and bashful to lay hold of that. Be like these daughters. Be like these daughters. Trust God. And be bold to stand on his promises. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you do not ask... You will never receive. Ask, be bold to stand on the promises of God and trust Him. But, you know, as, as you know, we, we have also been seeing these, these good examples. You know, these chapters that we've just sort of glanced over, uh, they also show some disturbing facts. Um, you know, if you look at the last verse of chapter 15 and the last verse of uh, chapter 16. This is what it says. Uh, let me read Joshua 15, verse 63. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Joshua, Joshua chapter 16 and verse 10. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of, of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. And Joshua chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, 
but did not utterly drive them out. Now, in all of this, can you see how the Israelites are slowly sort of moving away, slipping away, slipping you know, away from God's plan and God's purposes. And it seems to be intensifying, right? You know, in that first verse, 63, it's just the inhabitants of Jerusalem, right? Uh, it, it just seems to be increasing and increasing. You know, the, the inability of Judah first. And then Ephraim, you know, they, it's about one city, right? It's about one city, their failure to expel, you know, the, the Canaanites from that city. And then it gets worse. It gets worse in, in the last one, what the people of Manasseh do. And, and we look at that. Um, you know, God's clear directions for his people was that the residents of this land, Canaan, they must not live in the land. God had commanded Israel clearly to destroy them completely, to destroy them completely, to show no grace. Deuteronomy 7 verse 2, destroy them completely. Why? Because, you know, these people, they followed false gods. That would corrupt Israel. Their practices, their pagan practices would corrupt Israel. And that's why God had said, destroy them. But here, you know, Ephraim and Manasseh, they show that they have already begun to lose that vision. You know, it, it says over there, now when the people of Israel, the, the last one, were Joshua 17, verse 13, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not utterly drive them out. See, at first, at first, Manasseh was strong. And so, you know, Israel could not defeat them. But then, when the people of Israel grew strong, what happened? They could drive those enemies out, but they did not. They did not follow God's command. They thought about themselves. And so they chose to make these Canaanites as, you know, to put them into forced labor, to make them their slaves and their servants, rather than to drive them out. What does it tell us? You know, on the day of battle, they were faithful. But, you know, in their everyday living, they were unfaithful. You know, Davis, he writes this, the Christian's faith is not so much proved by his courage in a sudden crisis as by his faithfulness in daily plodding. The Christian's faith is not so much proved by his courage in a sudden crisis as by his faithfulness in daily plodding. My dear brothers and sisters, are we faithful in the little things of life also? You know, just as we are faithful in the big things which everybody, you know, sees and everybody notices, you know, we are faithful in those things, are we also faithful in the little things? In the everyday plodding, are we faithful to God? Are we faithful to God? And then finally, and in verses 14 to 18, we see that this intense intensifies even more. The problem is, is growing. The problem is growing. Listen, verse 14 onwards. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me. And Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up by yourself to the forest, and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, 
since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Bethshean and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. Now, if you take what, you know, the people of uh, Ephraim and Manasseh are telling, are coming and telling Joshua, if you compare that with what Caleb came and told Joshua, you'll see a huge, a very stark contrast. You remember Caleb, when he came to Joshua, he remembered the promises of God. Again and again, he remembers the promises of God. And he says that he followed God even when, you know, he was singled out. When it was unpopular, he followed God. He didn't go with the crowd. He followed God. And you remember what Caleb says. Give me this hill country. It's, it's a difficult place. It's a difficult land. Give me this hill country, he says. And you remember, there are giants in that hill country. But Caleb says, God will help me, right, to defeat them. He has kept me alive till 85. I will go and defeat them with God, with God. But you, com you compare that to what these two tribes are now coming and telling Joshua. They are saying, we are a numerous people. Caleb was by himself alone. And he went and fought against the giants. He went to a hill country and gained his inheritance over there. These are a numerous people. And they're saying, you know, this is not enough for us. This is not enough. That's, that single man, Caleb, he had the courage to go up against the giants. And you see, what the people of uh, Ephraim and Manasseh are saying in verse 16. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron. You see, this is out of fear. They don't want to go over there because they are afraid of the enemy. They are not trusting in God. They, they are not trusting in what God has promised them. And so ultimately you see how, you know, all of this is, you know, creating problems for Israel itself. You know, they are not content. They are not content with what God has allotted to them. And they are not taking up the challenge to trust God and to go up against the enemy. What about us? What about us? Are we content with what God has given us? Will we take up the challenge to go up even in a hill country, even to fight against giants? Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. We've seen the example of parents this morning. Jacob, Joseph, men of God, and how they blessed their children, how they wanted blessings to fall upon their children, the blessings of God. Do you pray for your children? Do you bless your children? And what are we teaching our children? Whether 
sons or daughters? Are we teaching them through our example to boldly trust in God's promises and to claim the promises of God just like those five daughters? Even though they were far away from the promised land, they, they trusted God and they claimed the inheritance then. Do you have such kind of faith? Are we showing that kind of faith to our children? Or are we like these two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, who did not obey God and who was slowly fading away from, God, from that vision of God, the commandment that God had given them? Are we faithful? in the little things of life, are we faithful to him every day? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, O God, for the examples that you've set before us this morning in this book of Joshua. And Lord God, we, we pray, O Master, we pray that we wouldn't be afraid of the enemy, but that we would trust in you. We would trust in your promises. We would trust in your armor that you've given us to fight the enemy. And Lord, as we do that, maybe set up, maybe be a model, maybe be an example to our children. Lord, we pray that we would be like the father of those five daughters who trusted in you even though they were so far away from the promised land to claim their inheritance. May we be that kind of an example to our children, O oh God. An example of faith. Lord, we pray and commit ourselves into your hands that as we continue to read your word, may your word come alive. And as we look at ourselves in the mirror of your word, Continue to challenge us, continue to correct us, and continue to perfect us, O perfect Father. We give ourselves into your hands again. In Jesus' most precious name we ask and we pray. Amen. Let's offer a word of prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you are the King of glory. The King of glory who sent your only son to come into this world because of your love. We thank you that you're a God who, who wants to be reconciled to us. You are a God who wants us to have an abundant life in Christ. So Lord, we pray that we, your children today, would claim these promises of you. Lord, that we would work towards having this abundant life in Christ. As we study your word, as we honor your word, as we obey your commandments, and as we exalt Christ each and every moment. Lord, we pray that as we say an amen here, and as we conclude our worship service, Master, as we go out, May we continue to worship you. And may others around us, as they see us, may they know that we worship the living God. Help us not to be fearful of that, O oh God, but help us to show our love in word and in action. And teach us to be more and more like Christ in all that we do. Thank you, O oh God, for the privilege that we have to worship you even in our giving. Bless these offerings that we have received, O oh Master. Bless them and use them for the extension of your kingdom. Continue to bless us and be with us. For we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Receive the benediction in faith. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, 
in the sweet communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest, remain, and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Please wait back for some snacks over there, but have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead. God bless.